SECF uh, is a conservation-based organization. Our mission is to um, protect and care for Southwest Florida's coastal ecosystems. We were founded in 1967 with the sole purpose of trying to protect and preserve the unique natural resources of Sanibel and Captiva Islands. Um, trying to, um, to improve the ocean's future uh, one person at a time. And that's really our goal, is, is to educate people about these unique resources, uh, to, to advocate for them, uh, because the, the wildlife and, and the resources don't have advocates. Um, they can't advocate for themselves, so we want to be those advocates for them. The day after the storm, uh, SECF went to work. Um, we began coordinating directly with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the J.N. Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge the city of Sanibel, as well as our partners at uh, Sanibel Fire to provide equipment and supplies. We have a research vessel called the Norma Campbell, the RV Norma Campbell, which is a 32-foot Munson uh, research vessel that has, a, a, it's like a landing craft where we can ha uh, put equipment on such as UTVs, utility vehicles, ATVs, and things like that. Uh, put that equipment on the boat and transport it from Port Sanibel Marina over to Tarpon Bay and, and use that for our recovery efforts. Uh, then we moved into supporting uh, the city of Sanibel, uh, Sanibel Fire and other partners uh, to help them with their recovery efforts and get their staff out here to do their assessments and, and recovery. Um, then we moved into helping and supporting the community. Part of the, the first response to the island um, was to not only help the humans get off the island, but to also go to those homes where people had to evacuate and leave pets behind, primarily cats and um, some dogs, birds, and other domestic animals. You know, Sanibel and Captiva Islands are barrier islands along the coast of Southwest Florida. Uh, and they essentially, um, you know, are that first line of defense as storms move through to the area before they hit the mainland. Uh, they hit those barrier islands first. With Ding Darling being the largest landowner on Sanibel and uh, with SECF being the largest private landowner and the city of Sanibel um, being the largest public landowner, um, we've been able to protect about 70% of the entire island. As you look around, you can see the devastation, uh, the brown vegetation, um, but the good news is that the, the habitats here on the island um, that we manage and maintain and 70% of the island are native landscapes which means that these vegetation uh, communities have adapted over uh, you know, millions of years to adapt to disturbances such as hurricanes and other storm events. And so they're the first to recover and they're the first to be there for the wildlife and provide that habitat that's needed following the storm. Our field season for sea turtles starts on April 15th and so we were just kind of winding down as far as sea turtles go. They nest from about the end of April through early August and then they'll hatch through the end of October. We still have one remaining nest after the storm so we're still waiting on that one to hopefully hatch. We do see some erosion where these runnels, like you can see right here, came through. Um, just deep runnels that where the water was. And the dune vegetation is pretty much destroyed. We lost a lot of dunes, so we'll have to restore those. Um, but otherwise, the beach is still here, and wildlife is resilient. I think we don't give them enough credit. You know, they, they've existed in these habitats where hurricanes occur for a long time, and they've figured out strategies that work. So since the storm hit, we've seen lower numbers in comparison to our previous uh, October shorebird surveys. Um, but that doesn't mean the birds are gone. When a storm is coming around, um, birds are really sensitive to barometric pressure, so they can sense that a big storm is coming in. Um, so they will either fly away, um, some birds will just hunker down here in the trees, or they'll, they'll seek shelter in a, in a calmer location rather than stick it out here. And so it's important to give them the space that they need to, to, to thrive out here and, and recover from the effects of the hurricane. Animals that are on the island are um, our freshwater species because we have an extensive, or at least before the storm, uh, we had extensive interior freshwater wetlands on this island, which is very unique for barrier islands. Um, most of the time you would see salt marsh, but on our islands we actually have freshwater habitat with freshwater species inhabiting those areas. Uh, and we know that those areas now um, are, are mostly saltwater. The, the freshwater marshes on the island are really driven by rainfall. So there will probably be a short-term uh, shift from uh, freshwater communities to saltwater. Um, so we think it's going to take several years before those communities shift back to pr predominantly freshwater ecosystems. 
This is what you use to track turtles with? Yeah, we put those on several species of turtles. So this is a radio transmitter that gives off a, a signal and we have a receiver that picks up a beep. And uh, what we do is we hold up an antenna and we're holding a receiver in an area where we last saw this animal. And if we're able to get a signal, then we're able to follow that signal and hopefully find the animal. We have tracked already all the turtles that we had transmitters on. Actually, most of them are still around. Uh, we did have some mortalities. We have a couple that are still missing, but some of the species like box turtles uh, have done very well, even though certain parts of the island where they were at had eight to 12 feet of storm surge and the animals are still there. In the wake of the storm, I was called almost immediately by the Florida Institute of Oceanography to take a research cruise offshore to study the nearshore Gulf of Mexico in response to the storm. All of the fresh water and all the nutrients that were um, uh, introduced into the Gulf of Mexico after the storm uh, probably are having a tremendous impact on the ecology and overall ecosystem and the food web in the Gulf of Mexico. Before the storm, a big part of our focus was on water quality. You know, we saw a big spike in, um, in, in a number of bacteria that are really harmful uh, to people in our, you know, that want to go into the waters. There's a lot of creatures, especially bacteria, microscopic things that you can't see uh, that are always there and growing. And the problem is if you swim in those areas and you have an open wound or if you have an infection or have an immunocompromised um, body, then those things can take over fairly easily. And especially after a storm where you have a lot of potential uh, waste, waste water that has been accidentally discharged because of power failures, because of flooding, um, it's not uncommon uh, for those things to happen. And it's definitely not safe to, to drink. But the thing that, um, that's unseen in water quality is the dissolved oxygen levels. So when you have all the leaves that blew off the trees on the island and, and in all the areas around the estuary, that creates a tremendous demand for oxygen. So all the bacteria that are consuming that and, and using up oxygen, and it decreases it to a level where fish can't survive. And if they can't survive, they'll, they'll either wind up dead on shore or they'll try and swim away. I mean, in a, in a non-hurricane time, water quality is something that I think about all the time. And now to see what's going on is really disheartening and there's no, there's no easy answers. There are things that we need to be thinking about um, as we rebuild and we rebuild with resiliency in mind. Things like having septic in a coastal town in Florida is just not a solution that will carry us into the future because any time that we get water and those septics flood, that's nutrients that's being pumped in. Same with stormwater. There's stormwater rulemaking going on right now that we're participating in to try to control some of these stormwater releases. And then hardening our wastewater treatment plants and having a plan for how to bring those back online. Um, because if you're having a piecemeal approach to bringing wastewater back online and then other breakages are happening and suddenly you're hemorrh hemorrhaging sewage uh, other places, it's really just a, a, a bad situation made worse. So RECON is the River Estuary Coastal Observing Network. It is a system of real-time water quality sensors that we have located in the river, in the Pine Island Sound, and near shore Gulf of Mexico. We established it in 2007 to fill in a gap of real-time water quality data. It's really good that we were able to collect that data during the storm, but it's also really important that we get these sensors back online now to look at the recovery. Um, so I'm filtering is water for nutrient sampling. So um, in the lab we have a big machine that does inorganic nutrients like mm -hmm. phosphates, nitrates, stuff like that. Um, so every time, pretty much every time we go out, we'll try and at least get a sample like this. It's pretty easy to take and it's super valuable information. Alrighty, get ready to toss this in the water. It's actually one of our 2.0 version recon, which we had 
just fundraised for last year and just were able to get out some of them before the storm. Um, so we're happy that it survived. Um, there is that well, which is that PVC pipe that we attach to the piling. That protects the sensor and the sensor hangs inside that well at a constant elevation. Um, to power the system, there's a solar panel in a little box we have a battery in and a charge controller. And then the round little uh, coffee can looking device, that's the data logger and modem. So that controls the sensor, tells it when to sample, takes the readings from the sensors and transmits that to our website, which anyone from the public can go on at any time, look at the most recent data. This has been my family home for 47 years. My dad built the house in 1975. They were a big part. I lived there for a few years in 75, came back in 80s for another few years. I'm part-time up north. Um, been about five years since I'm full-time resident here. Um, been volunteering for SCCF for a couple years now. I wanted to make it my future without a little interruption. Um, SECF has just been a wonderful organization and all the people and when Kaylee sent me an email a couple weeks ago that they wanted to come out and help I just started crying. It's um, the community here is just unbelievable and I really appreciate it. We're sitting in a place where we can take learnings from this. We're going to have a lot of data coming out of this. We have a lot of anecdotal horrible horrible stories of what's going on and you can see the devastation around you and once we can parse out what is controllable and what's not controllable I think we'll be able to orient ourselves in such a way that we can rebuild with resiliency in mind and rebuild smartly because if we don't think about resiliency when we're rebuilding then the only option left is going to be retreat and places in Florida are having to do that already. Places in the East Coast are having to do that. Everyone's seen the videos of houses falling into the ocean. And that's not something that we can just ignore, especially for us where we live and work on barrier islands. We are so integrally, integrally connected to every aspect of climate change. And every millimeter that the sea rises, that has a huge effect on our way of life, our economy, our ecology, and all our wildlife around here. You know, it was really all hands on deck and I, I honestly could not be more proud of our staff. It really honestly uh, gives me chills to think about how everybody stepped up in such a big way uh, to support our community. And, and the community out here is just so special and they, they're, they're here to help each other and they continue today uh, help to help, help their fellow residents on the island. The staff has been incredible and there are moments like now that can't be missed as far as scientific opportunities. We're trying our best and we have colleagues that are reaching out to us, to all of us, all of the staff saying, we wanna be there, we wanna learn more about the storm and, and how it affects people's properties, how natural areas have protected those properties. And at the same time, we also feel that we're an important part of this community and we need to help our volunteers, our board members, uh, and other people who need help. I really want to, you know, commend the city of Sanibel and all of our partners at Lee County. I've never seen the city of Sanibel uh, or any other government work in such a, uh, a rapid and organized manner uh, with the support of the city or with the support of the state of Florida. And, and honestly, um, it's really emotional to see how quickly um, they've been able to do that and how hard they've all worked and continue to work. Um, this isn't gonna be a sprint, this is gonna be a marathon. 
And it's going to take all of us working hand in hand together for the long haul uh, to make sure that we, we preserve this sanctuary island uh, that we have here on Sanibel and Captiva and, uh, and get back to where we were and preserve um, the local economy and keep it a tourism based economy and uh, not, not to you know, allow it to shift uh, to promote more development in a way that could be harmful to our future economy. There's definitely going to be a time that you can experience Sanibel again. I think that's one of the, the benefits to these islands of Sanibel and Captiva is that we have been engineering with nature. We have locked up a ton of land for conservation and we do have all these natural spaces and nature is the best engineer. We're seeing the wildlife returning. We're seeing snakes and turtles and bobcats and eagles and all these animals coming back because it is a sanctuary island and it's a sanctuary not just for the people who live here but for the environment as well. We have a really strong community and the city of Sanibel supports our mission here at SCCF, so I believe that we can build back stronger. As we rebuild this island, I, I think it's really important to maintain that love of nature that we've always had out here. It's a really special island for that reason and I love working here. And as long as we can keep that mentality and continue to put the wildlife in the forefront of our minds, I think, I think we'll maintain this special little place. We should be more like turtles. We should be more like turtles. <laughs> That's what I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> Love it.